Welcome to Bethel, the fifth day after Pentecost and this 4th of July weekend. We've had some packed services the past weeks and are really excited about worshiping with you again today. Uh, thanks for the great 4th of July picks, uh, even the ones from past celebrations here at Bethel. We hope uh, your weekend with your family was fun and full of yummy, yummy food. This week we're also celebrating uh, the ordination of women in the ELCA. 50 years ago, women finally had permission to become pastors. Um, all I know for myself is I'm grateful for the leadership, knowledge, and grace of the many uh, female pastors that I know. As we continue to keep up to date with the COVID-19 reality in our county, we're committed to share what we know with you. At this time, we're able to have small outdoor group meetings on our campus, so I'd love to talk to anybody who's interested in having uh, your group meet here with your ministries. For those interested in more details related to what we're working through, we will meet online at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, the 8th of July. Uh, that'll happen during our regular Pastor Don hangout time. Uh, so also in the meantime, uh, please feel free to uh, email me with questions, suggestions, um, or concerns. Now here's a reminder of the plan for the month of July. Now here are some ways that we're continuing to do life together here at Bethel. So for kids, we've got Sundays at two o'clock, the Parent Fellowship, and also every Saturday at 10 a.m. story time. So make sure you stay tuned in that with uh, our Kid Connection Ministry. Uh, for young adults and youth, um, our Sunday uh, morning and Wednesday night um, activities, and a special one coming up on uh, Wednesday, July 15th, we're having our senior high COVID camp out, uh, safely distanced and tented on the front lawn. So we'll give you more uh, updates on that and show some pictures when we get that done. Um, for adults, uh, you can see the scoop on what's going on. Um, lots of great things. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we've got the uh, meeting coming up about reopening, which will be on the 8th. Um, also, here are some pictures from our last um, motorcycle or Bethel, Mo Bethel Motorcycle Club ride. Uh, we had a great time and we'll be doing another one soon. So make sure you talk to me uh, if you're interested in joining us. Now, here a treat. Uh, check out these announcements from Patricia. Uh, we've got some great upcoming events. So, my name is Patricia, and I want to see if you know what these things have in common. My burnt toast. My beautiful art piece. My musical talent. Well, all the, what these things have in common is that I have no talent, but I do know that there's a lot of you at Bethel that do, and we would love to see that talent, whether it's a family skit, playing a musical instrument, singing, cooking a cake. Um, we are having a Bethel Scott Talent night on Friday, July 24th at 7 p.m., and all you have to do to be a part of it is go to my email and sign up just let me know what you'll be doing and then i will give instructions from there and then all the rest of you have to do is tune in july 24th at the zoom 7 p.m have some popcorn in front of you and enjoy bethel's got talent so go ahead start working on it and looking forward to it Okay, so this is for our ministry leaders. We have a wonderful ministry leader gathering um, happening July 28th. It's a Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Zoom link will be on the webpage. And this is a time we can all look forward to coming together, seeing everyone, checking in. Um, the theme will be moving forward and talking about the things we can do. Um, so it's a time to get enlightened, uh, challenged and informed so looking forward to seeing you there it would be a lot of fun see you there thanks patricia i can't wait to be part of these uh, we are also excited to have randy shattuck back to us uh, to give the sermon today as he'll share some thoughts on the two americas um, a couple of weeks ago we had a zoom meeting with some of our mission to mexico crew and our esperanza friends in tijuana I thought today would be a great day to show some of the highlights uh, from our 90-minute Zoom that we had with our South of the Border Americans. If you want to see the whole video, um, you'll be able to check it out on our Bethel um, YouTube channel. So make sure to enjoy these next minutes. So it's really nice to see you guys. 
Um, those of you who are with Esperanza, um, our heart is with you. It was very sad that we couldn't be with you last month. Here. But we're uh, hoping to be with you again soon. And right now, we're, my heart is full. We're with you right now. It's a very good thing for us to see everyone, you guys, in, in the video. Um, we are very emotional to see you guys. Really, we miss you so much in this last summer. Uh, but we understand, like, at the same situation mm -hmm. we are happening in my side. Um, it's complicated our life in our side, like in your side too. And now you have more complication in your side about those uh, disturbs with uh, Floyd, with this guy Floyd. Um, it's a lot of things happening in California that what we see in the news. So uh, Aida is saying that uh, she's been talking to uh, members in the community and they really miss you guys. So they're, they're really asking, when are you guys coming back uh, to work with them? Uh, so she just wanted to point out that it's a comment that has come up many times that they really miss you and they're looking forward to having you guys soon. It's not only the community. Of course, our team and staff, Esperanza staff, we miss you guys so much. Uh, and we ask, we ask the same question, you know, are you guys gonna come back again? Yes, the, the plan is to come back. As soon as things open up that we can travel safely back and forth, um, and as soon as things in Tijuana are to the place where you know, the virus is somewhat contained, so it's not just going crazy, um, our plan is to be back. And then I just saw that there's going to be a new t-shirt, so oh, we have to go back. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's an important thing. But yeah, our hearts are with you. Um, we were really sad. My, my kids were very sad that we couldn't come in April. Um, and I'm, not, I'm not sure of the exact dates, but we are, we are, we're coming back. And just and so then, Bethel, so you guys yeah. know Bethel that we also still contributed twenty five hundred dollars of our spring trip that we didn't go on to oh, Esperanza. Nice. So wow. we we're still know. we're committed for the long haul with you guys. So we will be back. That's another thing I can share with you guys. Uh, in the name of the Esperanza team, we can say thank you, thank you to maintain that uh, emotional with Esperanza, keeping all Esperanza stuff. Because we're not working, we are in home. Well, we're working in some way by computer, but we're in home and still we receive a complete salary. Uh, and that's an amazing, you know. The other way, I don't know how we can survive. Hey, Tom, if it turns out that it sounds like we probably no, won't, probably won't yeah. go uh, uh -huh. in September. Could we okay. do like a little hey, Bobby. fiesta? Hey. <laughs> do a little virtual fiesta with everybody and then whoever can write their check and send it in? You bet. Another question for you guys. How how happened right now with all these things? Uh, with uh, oh my, uh, my amigo Floyd. Is not a bother your city? Yeah. It's bothering our city and it's bothering our hearts and our souls. We're very torn. Because every day we we see a lot of news, very bad news about. Oh. Yeah, no, Mexico good. prays for us, Eduardo. Yeah. <laughs> believe me, believe me, we pray for that and more every day. You can share all this information with the rest of the groups and people they never come to Esperanza and people they really want to come to Esperanza. Share all this information because I believe and I know we're not going to stop. There's a lot of families outside waiting for us. And our people are waiting for us. And we can beat this virus. And we can go back to the community. community. Yeah. But we, but we so, need you guys. Yes, we definitely need to be in the solution together to help out this globe. Um, if you're interested in joining us on future uh, Mission to Mexico trips, make sure you talk to me. Now, everybody join our opening song, Everyone Needs a Little. Everyone needs 
a little rest Everyone needs a little joy And a song to sing in the darkest night Life, even when it gets you down the hole Will turn it all around And love is the greatest of these Everyone needs a little Now please join me in the prayer of the day. Creator God, you have created us to walk with you. Help us walk with you in this time of worship that we may be strengthened to walk with you all the days of our lives. As we come to you this day, bless us with your grace and your rest that we might find renewal and the strength to serve with confidence and joy. Amen. Now please enjoy the Freckman family with a special greeting from the California coast. Peace be with you. We invite you to share Christ's peace with those near and far.
Good morning. Well, Chip and I are here today because we want to talk to you about watching for God. And in our takeout churches this year, most of you received one. And if you didn't receive one, you can still get one now. Just go ahead to our website and you can contact me. And in those takeout churches, we have watch for God bracelets right here. And what I encourage all of you to do is I encourage you to wear your bracelet so you're reminded, or maybe put it next to your bed at night so when you wake up, you're reminded. Maybe put it on your kitchen table so when you're eating a meal, you're reminded to watch for God. Watch for God all day long. You can see God in the backyard, like where I am right now, maybe in your front yard. Maybe you see God in the house. Maybe you see a smile from your mom or your dad, or maybe you get a special phone call or an email from a friend or someone that you've been waiting to hear from. All these things can be moments where we feel God and we know God is with us because we know God is with us in the big moments and in the little moments. In our heart, in our little heart, God resides in there. So that's what is so amazing about God is that God is everywhere. So right now I would like to pass this on, well Chip and I would like to pass this on to our friends who have something to share with you of where they see God. Enjoy. Watch for God. And Landon, where do you see God? Helping others. To, he's helping us to be and do Legos and helping us to fix our knees. And he helps us to make food. God is around, God is around hummingbirds. Well, birds, I should say. And one time I even saw a hummingbird and it was 10 feet away from me, looking at me directly. That's where we see God. God is around us and in our hearts. Thank you so very much, my friends. That was wonderful. And I encourage everyone, everyone watching today, if you have a bracelet or don't have a bracelet, watch for God. See where you see God in the simplest things, in the complicated things, in the small things, and in the big things. All right, let's go ahead. Let's close in prayer. Let's prepare our hearts and mind. What does that look like? And what does that sound like? Good and gracious God, help us to sit in the quiet and to recognize when you are there, you are there in our hearts. You are there all around us. You are there in the little things and you are there in the big things. Your love for us is that amazing. Your love for others is that amazing. Please help us to show that love with everyone around us. In your name we pray, amen. All right, have a great week and I'll see you again soon. Take care. Thanks for your message, Amanda. Now let's join Robin, Lars, and Mark in the reading of the lessons. In our first lesson, we hear Moses speaking to the Israelites in Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 to 22. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens. 
the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your ancestors and loved them, and he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations, as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. Fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. He is the one you praise. He is your God who performed for you those great and awesome wonders you saw with your own eyes. Your ancestors who went down into Egypt were 70 in all. And now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. Here ends the first reading. The second lesson is Hebrews chapter 13 verses 1 through 3. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prisons, in prisons, as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 8. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Now please welcome back Randy Shattuck, the two Americas. I've had three really good days in my life. The first day that comes to mind was October 2 of 2003. That's the day my son Aiden was born. The second day was March 13 of the year 2000. That's the day when I first became a father. My oldest child, Teague, was born on that day. And the third day was June 19th of 1993. That's the day my wife lost her mind and actually said yes to marrying me in front of all those friends and family. Apparently she meant yes because after 27 years, she's still saying it. Well, this got me to thinking the other day about the best days of our lives the really big days that are life-changing. And I'm wondering what the really big days might be for you. Is it a birth, a wedding, someone passing away, or maybe even a graduation? Maybe it was your first day on the job or even retirement. All of these types of days tend to be milestones, forks in the road, if you will. After those really big days, things will be different. You'll move in a new direction. You'll notice that one of my really big days, my wedding anniversary, falls on June 19th. Well, what Kathy and I didn't know when we were planning our wedding in 1992 is that June 19th was also a big day for this nation and for African Americans. On June 19th of 1865, Army General Gordon Granger made this statement in Galveston, Texas. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. Today, we know this as Juneteenth, but initially it was known as Jubilee Day. Now, you may recall that in the Old Testament, Jubilee was an event that took place every 50 years. In the year of Ju Jubilee, all debts were forgiven. All Hebrew slaves and those sold into indentured servitude were set free. All lands were restored to the original boundary markers that were established right after the children of Israel came into the land of Canaan. Jubilee restored balance and it gave everyone a fresh start. It seems fitting to me that Juneteenth is also described as Jubilee Day. 
Had Kathy and I known in 1992 that June 19th was an important day in African American history, a further step toward the complete eradication of slavery from this land, which didn't happen, by the way, until December of 1865, had we known, we would have picked a different day. But we didn't know. We were unaware. I've come to believe that this sense of being unaware is all too common today. And maybe you know this feeling. Over the last decade or so, I've become very much aware of something that some people call the two Americas. Now, this does not mean that there are two different countries. It simply means that some people have one experience in America and other people have a very different kind of experience. And these two experiences are so radically different from each other as to be nearly unrecognizable. For instance, I have a client who's a financial advisor and she participates in financial literacy programs for youth in the Chicagoland area. And she had an African-American teenager in one of her programs. This young man had lived his entire life down in the streets of Chicago in a struggling, struggling neighborhood. The program was held on one of the top floors of a very tall building in the financial district. And as the young man entered the room, he got a view of Chicago that he'd never seen before, a view from the sky. And he said, wow, Chicago is actually beautiful. This is a classic example of the two Americas. This young man had grown up in Chicago and held a certain view of the city. But when he went up in that skyscraper and he looked out that window, he got a very different view of the place that he lived. I have a sense that many white Americans today are getting a view, a window, if you will, into the lives of African American people, and it is unsettling. This window often seems to come from cell phone video that's taken of black people being beaten or killed by law enforcement. In fact, I've come to believe that the two Americas are most visible in the way that some African Americans tend to feel about the police versus the way most other Americans seem to feel about the police. And this was made most evident to me right here on the paving stone steps outside of Bethel's main chapel. A few years ago, after the death of Oscar Grant, I asked Reginald Swilly for his perspective on the shooting. And you may recall that Reginald is the African-American husband of our former interim pastor, the wonderful Carol Bean. And he said, white people will say to their children, if anything goes wrong, call the police. They're your friend and they'll help you. But many black people say to their children, if something goes wrong, don't call the police. The two Americas. In one America, the police are your friend and they may even save your life in a desperate circumstance. But in another America, the police cannot be trusted because they just might be the ones who take your life. I don't know about you, but it's been incredibly eye-opening to see video after video of unarmed black men being shot to death or being held down until they cannot breathe and the very life is squeezed out of them. I find this gut-wrenching, heartbreaking, and frankly, it just makes me angry. I am repulsed and I am saddened, but my eyes are now much wider open than they've ever been. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised that there are two Americas. I encountered this very early in life. When I was a boy living in Northern Michigan, there were very few black people around. There was one older black lady who used to come to our church because our pastor's wife welcomed her. Kathy, our pastor's wife, was from Texas and she'd been around black people most of her life. She welcomed this lady and even encouraged her to sing. I remember she used to stand in front of the congregation and sing this song in this soulful voice that said, God is gonna get you. Her message was that God sees everything. And as Psalm 139 claims, light and dark are both alike to God. God sees all. A few years later, just as I was turning 13, my family moved from Northern Michigan to Northeastern Kentucky. And that was a big day in my life, a real fork in the road, let me tell you. Within a short period of time, it became clear to me that I was a Yankee and a whole lot of other people didn't see the world the way I did. For me, the Civil War was, it was ancient history, something I read about in books. 
But for some people in Kentucky, the Civil War was fresh and painful. You may recall that Kentucky was a border state during the Civil War. I guess you could say that I found the border and it was still very much alive. Kentucky is a beautiful state filled with some of the finest people I've ever known in my life. I live just a few miles from the Ohio River that borders the northern edge of Kentucky. And during the Civil War, the Ohio River served as a crucial milestone on the Underground Railroad. As soon as black people crossed that river, they were in free territory. Many people that I knew and worshiped with were proud of this heritage, but there were other people who felt very differently. I remember my homeroom teacher from the seventh grade. He used to sit in front of a room filled with about 60 white students and say things like, have you ever met a black man who couldn't dance? Ever met a black man who couldn't sing or run fast or dunk a basketball? They're born with that ability, you know, unlike you and me, we have to work for it, but it just comes naturally to them. These are the things he said. And bear in mind, this was in the late 1970s, long after the civil rights movement was over. Then there was my friend, Anthony. He was a young black man who was sweet on my cousin. And Anthony used to hang out with our families and go to church with us. We all loved Anthony. He was funny, he was kind, and he was a really good athlete. One Sunday after church, we invited Anthony over to our house in an all white neighborhood. We had lunch and then we went outside to play. And there was a community basketball hoop that I'd played at many times with other kids in the neighborhood. Well, we took Anthony with us and played for maybe an hour or so. And it didn't occur to me at the time that no other kids from the neighborhood came out to play with us. A few days later, I was shooting hoops again with neighborhood kids, and this time one of the fathers came out to play with us. I'd been around this man many times before, and he always made me laugh. He seemed like just such a good guy. Well, he shot some balls with us for a few minutes, and then, in almost a sly, sideways, southern drawl, he asked me, who was that dark fella I saw you with here the other day? And I said, oh, you mean our friend Anthony? And he said, you don't need to be bringing that N-word around here anymore. We don't like his kind in this neighborhood. I wish I could say that this sort of sentiment is all in the past. It's completely behind us. And we're so much better today as a people than we used to be. But I'm afraid that's not true. I'm afraid that the two Americas are maybe more pronounced, more distinct now than I've ever experienced in my lifetime. And some may say to me, Randy, that's all well and good, but race relations and policing tactics are social issues best left to politicians and policymakers. What does this have to do with religion, the Bible, or even with the gospel? That is a very good question. And I would add two questions to it. What is a biblical view of race? And what is a biblical view of slavery? You might be surprised to hear me say this, but the Bible actually has very little to say about race, if by race we mean the color of one's skin. There are very few places where skin color is even mentioned in the Bible. This near blindness to skin color may be the product of where the Bible comes from, the ancient land of Palestine set at the nexus of east and west on the old Silk Road that tied together Africa, Asia, and Europe. It would have been very common for someone living in ancient Palestine to see people of all different skin tones and to intermingle with them. Well, the Old Testament is filled with conflict between the children of Israel and other nations, but, but nowhere, nowhere is there an injunction to despise or enslave people because of their race. That does not exist. Their religious practices, especially those that involve child sacrifice, were the main issue. And in today's reading from Deuteronomy, we hear Moses compelling the Hebrew people just before they're about to enter the promised land to love the stranger. Why? Because of their experiences in Egypt where they were slaves, they were the stranger. They know the pain of being second class, of being scorned, of being forced to labor, and of having their humanity stripped away. Moses makes it clear that God loves the stranger and provides for the stranger, as we heard two weeks ago, about Hagar and Ishmael. But maybe the strongest statement about race in the Old Testament comes from Genesis, 
where God creates human beings and calls them good. Given the richness and diversity that we see in all other forms of creation, we have every reason to believe that God is the author of skin tones. This means that black is beautiful. God is the creator of blackness and God blesses blackness by calling it very good. But more than this, if we concede that humans are created in the very image of God, then some face of God must be black. That only stands to reason. Speaking of faces, you might be wondering what Jesus' face looked like. Well, since Christianity gained hold primarily in Europe, many white artists have portrayed Jesus as a white person. Long hair, light skin tones. I recently showed you all one of my favorite images of Jesus that hung in my grandmother's home. And as much as I love Heinrich Hoffmann's painting, it's not historically accurate. The Lutheran Study Bible shows this face of Jesus, based on the work of a forensic anthropologist who used Semite skulls from the first century to create this rendering. That's quite a difference. Jesus makes little distinction between insiders and outsiders. He says that the first will be last and the last will be first. He speaks to the Samaritan woman at the well almost like a sister. His answer to who is my neighbor includes a story where a Samaritan, an outcast at the time, is the hero, not members of his own religious family. He says that a centurion, a leader of the occupying Roman force, has greater faith than anyone in Israel. Then there's Paul, who says that since the time of Christ, there are no more Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, male or female. Of course, Paul is often erroneously quoted in 1 Corinthians as saying that slaves should remain slaves. Well, that's not at all what he was saying, as he clearly states, do not become slaves of human masters. But Paul also recognized the harsh reality of the Roman culture that he lived under, knowing that not all who came to follow Jesus would be able to gain their freedom. This is why he says in so many words, if you are a slave, don't let that hold you back from following Jesus. His letter to Philemon has been used to support the notion that Paul endorsed slavery. Well, this is not at all true, as evidenced by the way Paul speaks of Onesimus. Paul tells Philemon to welcome Onesimus back into his home, not as a slave, but as a brother, an equal, a family member. Well, time does not allow me to put forward many of the other passages that come to mind, but the Bible on the whole, let me say this for the record, hates slavery and compels us to welcome the stranger. But more than that, the passage today from Hebrews tells us that we should remember those who are being tortured as if we ourselves are being tortured. And this seems to me a fitting description of what I see today when I look at the two Americas. Black lives matter to me because they matter to our Lord. Black lives matter to me because blackness is a reflection of the Creator. Black lives matter to me because black lives are at far greater risk of being taken unjustly and for minor offenses where the punishment does not fit the crime. So what do we do about it? Well, I'd like to suggest a few steps that we can all take together. First, let's recognize that this subject makes us uncomfortable. We should just be honest about that. It's a struggle to talk about it and these things, and it should be. Struggle is good. If it moves us forward, then that's a good thing. This is a journey that we can take together, and it won't happen overnight. And I want you to know that I struggle with you. Second, I think we need to actively work to reduce our unawareness and to understand how systemic racism has hurt and continues to hurt people of color all around us. My mother recently said to me, I've never hurt black people or said awful things to them because I'm not racist. And that's a very true statement. But my family has enjoyed the benefits of a system that prizes whiteness while oppressing blackness. And if you're not sure what systemic racism means, just put those words in Google and start reading. Third, 
I believe we need to actively affirm blackness as God's good creation. Black is beautiful because God said so. So I ask you, what ways can we creatively, actively affirm people of color as being in the image of God? Fourth, as we become aware of how systemic racism works, we must confess it and renounce it. Last week, we asked our confirmants to renounce the dark one and all of the forces that oppose the will of God. As we explore this topic, we will discover a rather dark history. Unfortunately, the church in America has played an active role in oppressing people of color. We should recognize when it happened, confess it, and renounce it as evil. Fifth, we should commit ourselves as Jesus followers to be peacemakers and proponents of true justice. And this is where I believe this congregation has a tremendous opportunity. This nation needs our voice, our leadership, and our moral clarity. The arc of the moral universe is long, said Martin Luther King Jr., but it bends toward justice. Good news, we get to help it bend a little harder and that makes me very proud. And just in case you're wondering, on June 19th, Kathy and I now celebrate two great events, the day we got married and the day slaves in Texas were set free. And this is one small way that we reconcile the two Americas. Amen. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love, this they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with we each walk. other. Please join me as we pray for Bethel and our community and the world at large. Heavenly and gracious God, we appreciate all that you do and all the freedoms that we have. We thank you for the 4th of July celebrations. We ask as we continue to celebrate that you keep us safe and help us to remember the freedom we have is because of who you are and the gift you've given. Um, what you request of us is the first lesson today talked about is to to serve you, to walk with you, and to love you and those around us. And we do that through our prayers. And, and today as we pray, I especially want to lift up um, our friends and family and part of our community who are caring for those who are struggling. So we lift up Barb and her extended family and Kit and Gil and Alex and Kyle, Laurel and Rich, Sandy, Lois, Lori, Joanne, Nick, Terry, May, Mel, Gail, Betty, Doris, Brett, as they struggle to ways to care for those around them and those who are struggling, we ask you to bring healing hands to their family and friends. We especially also lift up the family of 
Maddie Danielson as they mourn her loss. And we especially ask you to surround Carol Olson during this very difficult time. We also rejoice. We rejoice with Trish and Rob and Jeremy and Madison and Aaliyah over, over Gentry's birth. And we just are appreciative of so much that you do. Give us eyes to see and ears to be so that we can be the hands and feet and heart that you want us to be. We pray for our call committee. We pray for our staff. And we pray for unity amongst the people that we see and help us to reach out to care for our neighbors and the people around us as you would care and as you care for us. And we bring all this to you because you are a God that says, I'm bigger than all that's going on and I want to hold you and surround you. And with the good and the bad, I walk with you. Um, and we do that. And we bring those prayers to you as we pray for um, together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. As we receive the offering, please continue to support Bethel as you are able. Uh, you'll see a slide in the middle of the song that uh, gives options for donations via mail, Vanco, and PushPay. Thank you very much.
As we close the service, please join in the prayer that our Mexico family shared a few weeks ago. So I'm just going to close some prayer. I'm going to say it in English. Leah is going to say it in Spanish. And then yeah. somehow God understands both, I think. I don't even know. Yes. But uh, Lord, thank you for this time together. Uh, uh, please remind us that our distance is only as far apart as our hearts are. Help uh, heal this world from the coronavirus. And help uh, heal this world from hatred. Y ayuda a sanar este mundo de, del odio. Uh, until we can see each other again. Hasta que podemos vernos. Keep uh, our relationships uh, deep and in our hearts daily. Uh, mantenga nuestras relaciones. Uh, que sean profundos. Amen. Um, Amen. 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 And now receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God give you the grace to never sell yourself short, grace to risk something big for something good, grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So may God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. May God take your hearts and set them on fire. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, go in peace and serve the Lord. Okay, we will. Now sing along with this classic Bill Withers song, Lean on Me. Have a great week, everyone.
Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Be safe. So much. We love you. Bye. We respect so much. Thank you, guys. I hope to see you soon. Yep. I send you a virtual hug for you. Take care.